Today I just wanted to go over the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit because I, I was actually thinking about it and I don't think I've ever gone over that before and it's act it's really important. Um, so I may as well just do it now. Um, as always, this is a teaching for women. I'm going to start in Matthew 12 from verse 31. Wherefore I say unto you, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men, but the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. And whosoever shall speak a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whosoever speaks a word against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him. So what's the Holy Ghost? It's the Holy Spirit of grace and truth. Grace being conviction, truth being wisdom. Grace isn't unmerited favour. Like, that's what the Christian church has told us. Um, that is pretty much, as far as I'm aware, what the whole Christian church believes the spirit of grace is, as well as the Torah movement. Because even though the Torah movement say, oh yeah, we should, we're sa they, they say we're saved by unmerited favour. At least this is what I've seen. Correct as if I'm wrong, because I don't actually know anyone apart from the people that like I've talked about this with and like learned from. Um, everyone is still adhering to the belief that the spirit of grace is unmerited favour. Um, but when you read the book of Jude and all of the prophets, really, you're going to see that these these men are going to creep into the church unawares. Um, and they're basically going to turn the grace of God, the conviction of God, the conviction on your heart that makes you obey God, that's appeared to everyone. Um, we'll go to Titus 2 in a second because we're going to actually define grace for, for the, the truth of it. Um, but in Jude, you'll see that the, there's these men crept into the church unawares and they're going to turn the grace of God into lasciviousness, into a license to sin. Um, so grace is conviction by definition. It's defined that way in the Strong's Concordance. If you actually just look it up, um, it's defined that way in scripture over and over again. Grace is conviction. It brings you to repentance. Um, the only, like, but the American church has just turned grace into favor because now in dictionaries, we just define grace as being like, just having favour, like unmerited favour. Um, but that's not how the Bible defines grace. So when you've got an entire church for so long now lying to everyone saying you're saved by unmerited favour, you can't do anything about it, it's a gift from God. This is why everyone is so complacent to the Ten Commandments. They're, they're saying that the Ten Commandments is works-based salvation or works-based salvation and... Um, even though we're told we, sh we should be um, serving God, loving our neighbour, um, and all these things are defined by the Bible. But again, the American church has just defined everything based on their own imagination. And it's just, it's spread to the four corners of the earth. And now pretty much most believers think that the grace of God is unmerited favour and not conviction. And it's just, it's done a number. Um and this is what the, the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is. You are saying that the Holy Spirit is something it isn't. And it's actually preventing people from truly repenting and understanding what that feeling is inside of them where they know that they've done something wrong. That conscience. That's how grace works. It works through the conscience. Like I said, we will, we will go to Titus too. But like, oh man. So this is what the Messiah is talking about. I've kind of got ahead of myself. I've just gave you the, the answer really already. But he's quoting Jeremiah 23 and it goes into even more detail. So, um, we'll just keep reading in Matthew 12. Whosoever speaks a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whosoever shall speak against the Holy Ghost of grace and truth, it shall not be forgiven him. Neither in this world, neither in the world to come. So he's talking about Judgment Day and he's going to tell you that. And then Jeremiah 23 even tells you that it's about... Um, that's what's going to condemn people. If on judgment judgment day, you say saved by grace, meaning unmerited favour, you will not be forgiven. It's over. Um, this is why it's so serious. Because we are saved by grace. If you know what grace means, we're not saved by unmerited favour. We're saved by unmerited conviction. The conviction from God is unmerited. I never, 
ever in my life would have repented if I didn't feel that conviction. I have never, like, it's an unexplainable feeling. That conviction, knowing that something's wrong. In my own flesh, I never would have repented and started keeping the Sabbath. I was a heathen in the world. I was doing my own thing. Like, I never would have wanted to keep the Sabbath. But God's conviction was so powerful that it led us in that direction. It's like, that is what saves you. If you have faith in it, saved by grace through faith. We're saved by grace, conviction. If we let it convict us and we obey the conviction. Faith is always obedience. Faith is synonymous with obedience, always. So you are saved by God's spirit of grace if you obey it. Not of the dead works of sacrificial law that anyone should boast. But grace convicts us to keep the good works ordained of old, which is the covenants of promise, the Ten Commandments and the Rainbow Covenant. Essentially, keep the Ten Commandments and eat clean. And then the Messiah magnified the law, made it honourable, and he said, um, the two greatest commandments is loving God with all of your heart, soul, and mind, and loving your neighbour as yourself. And by definition, those things mean, if you actually go into Deuteronomy and Leviticus, those commandments that he elevated, he was always supposed to do this. God um, put it in the Messiah to do this because this was him making honourable the law. Um, so going from sacrificial law to the royal law that James 2 talks about. Um, so loving God means you dig into the Bible, seeking to obey it with all of your heart, soul, mind and strength. It is a heart condition. Um, and you listen to the full counsel of God. And basically you let God teach you the book. That, it's like a, it's a lifestyle change. You give your life to learn the book. That's loving God with all of your heart, soul, and mind. So it is just, it, you can say to love God means you keep his commandments because that's what 1 John 5, 3 says and it's what Deuteronomy 4 to 8 says. But deeper than that, it means that you really, like you start to live in faith to a level where you start giving your life to really learn the book and you realize God wrote a book. He's told us everything that's to come and everything that will be. And he wants us to learn it so that we can do what? So that we can go and love our neighbour and tell them what it says. But then your neighbour's going to hate you when you do that because it's not a fun story. Um, the fun part comes after all of the call into repentance. <laughs> so. But anyway. How was I up to? Verse 33. Either make the tree good and his fruit good or else make the tree corrupt and his fruit corrupt. For the tree is known by his fruit. Um, o generation of vipers, how can you, being evil, speak good things? What are the good things? Why call us me good? If you will enter into life, keep the commandments. Then you've got in Ephesians 2, we're saved by grace through faith because grace convicts us to keep the good works, which is the covenants of promise that grafts you into Israel. That's everything that Ephesians 2 is saying. If you keep those good works, the covenants of promise, you will become part of Israel, a.k.a. be born again. Um, so how can you, being evil, sinning against God, preach the gospel? How can you preach the refreshing of the covenant, the good tidings, the glad tidings? How can you preach that? You can't. It's only um, for out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So out of the abundance of, of your sin, say, well, so in your heart, you don't want to obey God. This is the Christian church. They don't want to keep the Ten Commandments. So what do they say? We're saved by unmerited favour. It doesn't matter if we, um, we don't have to keep the Sabbath anymore. It's connected. We don't have to keep the Sabbath anymore. I don't want to obey God. That's what's going on there. <laughs> so they say things. Um, they buy into the lies like, oh, unmerited favour. <gasps> Whoa. Oh my goodness. Wow. Do you want to sell my name? Um, but I shall say unto you, well, no, a good man out of the good treasure of the heart brings forth good things. Um, so when your heart is bent towards God and you're starting to obey God, you will be able to preach the good things. You won't have guile on your mouth. And who doesn't have guile on the mouth? The 144,000. And an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart, out of the evil treasure brings forth evil things but i say unto you that every idle word that means really it means like there's a few different meanings for it. idle it can mean like slow lazy and barren 
which is interesting because Peter promises us that basically if we obey God and I can't remember where it is. He says, if you do these things, um, you will never be barren and the fruit of God. And then Peter also tells you that the fruit of God is the knowledge of God. So the good fruit is having the knowledge of God because who teaches you the knowledge of God? God. <laughs> so this isn't an intellectual thing. That's what people get hung up on. They can't understand that um, this isn't figured out by man's intellect because it's just not. I wouldn't be able to understand it if that was the case. Um, but I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. Um, <clears throat> so this is when the, that's when the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost will never be forgiven. For by thy words, you shall be justified. And by thy words, you shall be condemned. Every man's word shall be his burden. That's our burden. Having no lies on our mouth. So what's um, the Messiah referencing? Jeremiah 23. We'll go from... Well, we'll just do from 31. Behold, I am against the prophets, saith the Lord, that use their tongues and say, he saith. So... What he's saying here is against the false prophets that use their tongues and basically say, oh, God said this and God didn't say. That's who God's against. That's who God is. That is who God is most mad at. That's why, why we're warned about being teachers. You can't, if you don't have the spirit of truth or you don't actually understand the Bible, you shouldn't be teaching. Don't teach anything. Um, and when you do teach, only teach what you know. Like I would, I would never get on here and just like try and teach something that I had no idea about. Because you're held to a higher standard. And the whole reason why you teach people is because you want them to repent and have the truth. If you don't know what you're talking about and you come on to preach, the reason why you're preaching is because you want your own vain glory. And that's embarrassing. So behold, I am against them that prophesy false dreams, said the Lord, and do tell them and cause my people to error by their lies and by their lightness. Yet I sent them not. So God's saying these people who are prophesying lies and just telling their like bullshit dreams. I didn't even send them. But they're saying God sent me and God sent, said this. But God has sent some people. So who are these people? Let's quickly do a detour. Because God hasn't sent these prophets. But he has sent some, a group of people. And who are those people? I'm just going to do a little shortcut to this. I did a video the other day, but my, to be fair, my husband did a, like a pretty amazing video going through every cross reference and it was just, it was amazing. Um, so I'll probably link that below. Um, so Romans 10. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have, they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? Sent by who? Sent by God. So God is going to send these people. As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace. Peace is the Ten Commandments. The gospel is the refreshing of the covenant and the good and glad tidings means the refreshing of the covenant. That's what these people are going to be teaching. They're going to be teaching you to keep the Ten Commandments because... They're going to teach you that the spirit of grace convicts you to keep the Ten Commandments. And if you have faith in that conviction, you will receive the spirit of truth and be set free. And then when that happens, you need to go and pay it forward and fulfill the royal law. That's the whole, that's like the, that's the servant's part of the gospel. Okay. Um, and how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things, but they have not all obeyed the gospel. Many were called to do this. That's why we're seeing the Torah movement, but few are choosing to actually do it because they don't like putting their face out there. And it is hard, but you've got to push through because for the sake of God and his people. Like, that's the thing. Like, I don't naturally want to just do videos like this. But you can't, you actually just can't not. You love the people too much. And especially like in the church, 
when you read the Bible, there are people in the churches that are desperate to hear this stuff and they're just being lied to. Just absolutely just being destroyed by these pastors that couldn't give a shit about their salvation at all. Um, but they have not all, be all obeyed the gospel for Isaiah says, Lord, who hath believed our report? So Paul is telling us that God is going to send some people to teach the Ten Commandments, really. They're going to teach the gospel, the refreshing of the covenant. Um, and those that do that are obeying the gospel. <laughs> the Christian church isn't obeying the gospel. Neither is the Torah movement. So he says, for a, is, as it is written, where is it written? Because this is going to tell us exactly who these people are. Um... Fifty-two, Isaiah fifty-two. I think. Again, I'm not going to read the whole chapter. Go and read it, and I'll link Richie's video. But I'm just going to do like a shortcut. So from we'll go from where, when Paul is saying all that, all those who call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. This is why he's saying it. So Isaiah fifty-two six. Therefore, my people shall know my name. Therefore, they shall know in that day that I am he that does speak. Behold, it is I. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him that brings good tidings, that publish peace, 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 peace that brings good tidings of good, that publishes salvation, that saith unto Zion, thy God reigneth. Thy watchmen shall lift up the voice, with the voice together shall they sing, for they shall see eye to eye when the Lord shall bring again Zion. It's the watchmen. Is if you want to know what a watchman is, because do you know why it's important? The Messiah says, what he says to the porter, he puts a porter in the gate, what he says to that porter, he says to everyone, watch. He's saying, become a watchman. That's Ezekiel 2, 3 and 33. That's your go-to for how to be a watchman. You shout repentance. Once you learn the book, you teach the book. You warn people of what's going to come. Um, and God will be with you the whole way because he teaches you everything through the spirit. But that's what the gospel is. That's what this is saying. The watchmen are the ones that have been sent. So back to Jeremiah 23. These people have not been sent. The people saying, saved by unmerited favor. They have not been sent. The people telling you the bullshit Jesus dreams, they have not been sent. It's demonic, actually. Um, so, and when this people... Mm, Yeah, actually, Jeremiah twenty three thirty three, And when this people or the prophet or a priest shall ask you, saying, What is the burden of the Lord? You shall then say unto them, What burden? I will even forsake you, saith the Lord. And as for the prophet and the priest and the people that shall say the burden of the Lord, I will even punish that man in this house. So the Messiah was telling you that the, our burden is essentially what comes out of our mouth. Is it fruitful or not? Or not? Um, and that's the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Um, Thus shall you say every one to his neighbor and every one to his brother, what has the Lord answered and what has the Lord spoken? And the burden of the Lord shall you mention no more. For every man's word shall be his burden. He's saying, no, not the burden of the Lord. Every man's word shall be his burden in the day of judgment. So if you rock up on the day of judgment and blaspheme the, the Holy Spirit of grace and say, um, saved by unmerited favor. The Lord's bur burden of the Lord, the burden of the Lord. We couldn't do anything. He will even forsake you and you will not be forgiven. Like, come on, man. I'm going to go to Jude actually after this because you're going to see God even, this is the thing about the Bible. God writes down, right? These wicked people are going to step up and do this. So be not deceived. But then because the Christian church listened to the, those men, those wicked men, instead of reading it for themselves, they miss Jude, don't ignore what grace is, and listen to the evil men, Ooh. and ignore God's warning. Like, it's just crazy. Like, this Bible, I actually can't even put into words how, like, accurate this is about people's behaviour. It literally is. Like, the best way to put it is it's like you're reading the movie script and then watching the film. It's like you've seen how it's going to all turn out. 
The church is so apostate. The, the Bible is written against the church. This, the, bi the main thing of the Bible is that God's people are going to go apostate. And they're going to forsake his Ten Commandments. So God is going to have to raise up a group of people to teach the Ten Commandments again. Um, before judgment comes. Because he's going to destroy the earth. Because no one is, literally no one is listening to him. And another big thing of the Bible. It's all about this one great nation. This powerful, covetous, prideful nation. USA. And it's literally all about how they're leading the world. Especially the West. Um, in idolatry, through things like Hollywood. And just because it doesn't use words like that, that is literally what it's describing. And you, when you've got the spirit of truth, you can just see it. Um, this, it's all, right, so even if we take America out of it, who is this describing? The Bible talks about this great nation, the most powerful nation in the latter days, a multitude of nations within a nation. It's the most prideful, covetous, um, idolatrous nation it, again, in the latter days, so for context, out of all the nations right now, who is the most, who in it also called the hammer of the earth? Like, what is the leading currency? What, and also this, because this nation also is the face of God to the rest of the world. Who stands and says that we're a Christian nation for God and country? What nation is still a high percentage of, like, has a high percentage of Christians? It's not the UK. <laughs> we're pretty godless. Um, we're pretty atheist and mostly uh, Muslim, probably. And uh, not a lot, not a lot of Christians. The church is dead over here. But it's also kind of a a good thing because it's a it's actually a symptom and a sign of the times of how apostate the church is because all of the churches in the UK are apostate all of the churches in America are apostate but there's more of them and they still hold on to their beliefs and they still they literally stand on this bible and say we believe this with everything we have and they're bullshitting they don't know anything that it says they won't even keep the sabbath they they, they literally forsake the covenant and who gains intelligence with those who forsake the 10 commandments the antichrist God literally warned you in America to not forsake the covenant because the Antichrist, when he gets, when Satan gets cast down and the Antichrist, and the Antichrist rises up and creates this uh, false light, he's going gain, to gain intelligence with those who forsake the Holy Covenant. What's the Holy Covenant? The Ten Commandments. It's just crazy. Like, what do you, do you think you're going to get away with this? No. So repent now so that you don't have to go through this. Like the prophecies of what what's going to happen to children and um, families. And the reason why is because they actually, these people are lying about God's word intentionally because they don't, they don't care about what God said. So they're taking other people down with them. God is nowhere near as mad at the atheists and people who've never read the Bible. He's mad at the people who stand on the Bible and have done it for so long. And they're just fueled with self-righteousness. And they don't care about what God said about anything. That's who God's mad at. The people who say, God sent me to say this. And God didn't send them. Um, I forgot where I was reading from. Probably verse 37. <coughs> if you got bogey. You alright? Thus shall you say to the prophet, What hath the Lord answered thee? And what hath the Lord spoken? But since you say the burden of the Lord, therefore thus saith the Lord, because you say this word, the burden of the Lord, and I have sent unto you, saying, You shall not say the burden of the Lord. You shall not say unmerited favour. <laughs> Just scratch yourself in the eye. And therefore, behold, I, even I, will utterly forget you, and I will forsake you, in the city that I gave you and your fathers and cast you out of my presence. And I will bring an everlasting reproach upon you and a perpetual shame, which shall not be forgotten. You'll go to hell. Is it worth lying about what God's Holy Spirit is? The burden of the Lord is blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. That's what the Messiah is talking about. So just for a few more things on grace before I finish up here. Um, 
Whoa! Whoa! <laughs> Whoa! Flick! And um, Jude. So, Jude won forms, I think it is. For there are certain men crept in unawares to the church who were before of old ordained to this condemnation. Ungodly men, turn in the grace of our God. Conviction. Go to the Strong's Concordance. By grace are you saved through faith. Click on grace. It says divine influence on the heart and its reflection in the life. So it, grace influences your heart, convicts you, and then if you obey it, the reflection in the life shows your faith. Boom. So, for there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation. They, they were always going to do this. God knew their hearts. Ungodly men, turn in the grace of our God and lasciviousness, which is basically a license to sin. It means like a liberation to sin or something like that. So they're going to turn the conviction of God that causes repentance into a license to sin. They're, they've turned conviction into unmerited favor. It is unmerited. It will always be unmerited. We didn't convict ourselves to obey. God did give us conviction. And we can choose with free will whether or not we obey. We're not robots. So we choose whether we obey that conviction. Most people don't. And listen to this, actually. Let's do Titus 2. And then I'll just wrap up. Titus 2. It's going to tell you what grace is by definition and that who it's appeared to. Because the spirit of truth is only given to some and who are those some? Those who obey. Obey what? God's conviction. So this, the Holy Spirit is twofold. Another bullshit lie. So, Titus 2. I can't wait till people just stop lying. Titus 2.11. For the grace of God that brings salvation. It brings salvation. You've got to keep obeying. You can lose the Holy Spirit if you turn from it and... Like, think about this. If you, you can be born again, right? And be walking in obedience. Yeah. But if you let yourself slip, and like you murder someone, the Christians would tell you you can't lose your salvation. Yes, you can. <laughs> but it doesn't have to be as extreme as obviously murdering someone. That's probably like not the most realistic um, idea of how that looks. Um, but you can go back to envying other people and being malicious in your heart or being covetous or going back to the lusts of the world and things like that. Like that could easily happen. And we're actually told, the Messiah tells us in the parable of the four seeds, that's how people are going to fall. They're going to get offended when people hate them and um, come up against them because they're like, oh, like, I can't believe what you're saying. They're going to get offended at that. So then people with the Holy Spirit are then going to get upset by what they've said and they're not going to be able to... They're not going to be able... They're going to be cowards, basically, so then they're going to back off because people are coming up against them and, like, shaming them. Um. So they'll sort of... They'll fall away because of cowardice, because they want people to like them and they don't want to stick out like a sore thumb. So you have to just endure... And then the other reason is covetousness. They start to covet and envy and get wrapped back up in the cares and lusts of the world and stop um, giving their life to learn the book and teach the book, essentially. Um, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men <laughs> through our conscience. We have a conscience where God's conviction can work through that and can teach us to deny what is to to stop doing what is wrong and to start doing what is right, and how do we know if the conviction's true? You go with the word. Sanctify them in your word. Your word is truth. So if you, because sometimes your conviction can be seared with a hot iron, as as it's described, or you could be condemning yourself wrongly, because this world, the church predominantly, has created self righteousness. Where they say, oh, it's a sin to drink alcohol. It's a sin to, it's a sin to smoke cigarettes. It's a sin to have um, sex before marriage. It's a sin to fornicate. But if you're coming in agreement with someone to commit to them and to be together before God, you can have sex with them. Sex is marriage. You consummated the marriage. 
you don't it's not about papers or being married in a church that's the church's self-righteousness and it's a business it's organized crime that's what the church is so but then equally you could sear your conscience with a hot iron where the conviction doesn't really you don't really get convicted but then the more you read the more convicted you get and that's the sanctification process so the spirit of grace teaches us that denying ungodliness sin in worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Looking for that blessed hope and that glorious appearing of the great God and the Saviour Yeshua. Grace teaches us to deny sin, to stop sinning. Great, the spirit of grace convicts us to stop sinning. And if we have faith in that conviction, we will be saved and we'll be taught the Bible. That's the Cash 22 of, the, of Scripture. But as I was talking about drinking... So it says, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly. What does that mean? Um, so we'll go to 1 Thessalonians 5. So here's another thing that the church does. They read the Bible at face value. They just read it. Um, they, they don't even really read it. They don't give their life to actually read and study the book. They just, it's just a self, it's just a crutch of like, oh, I'm holier than now. It's just bogus. Um. But the Bible, God tells us in Isaiah 28 to read the Bible line upon line, here a little, there a little, precept upon precept. That means cross-referenced. That means that Hosea is given us the definition of something that James said, or James rather is given us the definition of something the Messiah said. And it's all interconnected. That's how you know when you read the Bible, you know that these men could not, it cannot have been done over this amount of time. They could not have just come together and um, like row it. Like, this is the spirit of God, and it's, as your faith increases and as you read it, you can, it's just so obvious. Um, so, we'll go to First Thessalonians, if I can find it. Um, so, the Bible is written that way, so that we don't define things for ourselves. So, if the Bible says peace, you don't have to, the gospel of peace. That doesn't mean the gospel of Zen. That doesn't mean the gospel of however you define peace. Peace is defined in the Old Testament is the Ten Commandments. So it's the gospel of the Ten Commandments. <laughs> and a peacemaker isn't someone who goes around and goes, stop fighting everybody. It's a, a peacemaker is someone who teaches the Ten Commandments, also known as the glad tidings that the watchmen preach. It's all, they're idioms. That's the best word to explain it. They're idioms that, um, it def it's a phrase that has its own definition. So grace teaches us to live soberly. What does that mean? First Thessalonians 5. Um, you are all children of the light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. What were we just saying? Become a watchman. What he says, what the Messiah says to the porter, he says to all, become a watchman. Ezekiel 2, 3 and 33 who was preaching the good tidings that Paul was talking about in Romans 10. Isaiah 52 tells you it's the watchman. Um, so being sober is synonymous with being a watchman. The spirit of grace convicts you to watch, to warn other people. They're all idioms. Um, just like it's, do you think this is actually saying? So if people say, oh, we need to be sober. You can't drink alcohol. No, you're defining it with your own imagination. You're just, you're just reading soberly and thinking, you can't drink alcohol and not go into the rest of scripture. There was people, there was tons of people drinking alcohol and getting drunk in the Bible. I'm sorry. Like, it's just, you can't, you can't ignore that. And the Bible doesn't contradict. And it's because it's written in idioms to its spiritual word pictures. That's how the spirit even reveals it to you because you, you don't lean on your own understanding. You lean on God's understanding. So do you really think that Paul's saying, let us not sleep as do others? Do you think he's saying, don't ever sleep physically? Of course he's not. He's saying, don't be asleep on the job. He's saying, when you, when, if don't, don't watch a Christian sin and don't say anything. That's, that's being asleep. That's not watching. That's not being a watchman. A watchman um, will not have blood on his hands because he warns others of sin. We're talking about in the church. Um, are we done? Oh my goodness. What a pretty pebble. Yeah, I think I'll just wrap it up there. Um, the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is calling the spirit of grace something that it's not. It's not unmerited favour, it's conviction. And that conviction leads you to obey and become a watchman.